In this one, we'll be looking at taking a 2080 Ti and trying to get a little bit more power out of it. Now, if you've had a 2080 Ti, you may have noticed that if you get a water block on it or you use some other extreme cooling method, maybe you've got an AIO attached to it, one of those um, AIO hybrid models, you may notice that very often you'll be power limited and the 2080 Ti will only pull so much power from the wall and that will make your clocks reduce and frames per second will ultimately suffer. So what can you do to do that? You can either cool the core down a little bit more so it's a little more efficient using less power or you can do what's commonly referred to as a shunt mod. Now a shunt in electrical terminology is just giving the component in question, this in this case a resistor, a path of lower resistance. So you may have seen other uh, channels perhaps using liquid metal on their resistors on their GPUs, um, but that's not great because the gallium and the indium, they don't react well with solder. So you don't really want to do that, especially for long-term use. Uh, maybe if you want to do a one-of benchmark, but just soldering on a small SMD resistor is the easier way to go. And then you can actually control that resistance and know exactly how much power you will be allowed to pull on top of it. And there's a simple calculation for that. So in this one, I'm going to take this apart. It's maybe a quick little demo on how to remove a water block if you have one. And like I said, this is the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme uh, with Gigabyte's water block on it. And it's not a great water block, but it, it does okay. And it's, it's a little better than what you get from one of the um, AliExpress water blocks. Um, but they're pretty comparable. Also got some resistors from AliExpress for about a dollar. Bought three packs just in case. They only come in a... Strips of five each, but we'll, we'll give that a try. And maybe if we try something, we get a, we got a couple extra resistors. We can try a different value if we need to. I uh, need a soldering iron and a multimeter. So really important to have if you do this kind of stuff at home, any mods, you know, if you want to make sure you're doing the right thing, don't just take somebody's word for it. You know, check the values yourself, make sure you're getting continuity where you should be and check the resistances to see if it actually made a good solder connection, all that kind of stuff. So make sure you got something like this. It doesn't need to be an expensive fluke. This one's mid-range, but it's okay. Um, just make sure you, you learn how to do this stuff properly yourself so you're educating yourself as well as taking care not to just destroy your stuff. All right, so the next part of this video, we'll take apart this 2080 Ti water block. All right, for this, this is a uh, magnetic project mat. I like to use these to keep track of the screws that come off of the GPU, and I'll just lay them out exactly in the way they come off. So I'll draw myself a little picture um, where the screws are, and then just make sure I put them exactly in the same places. Um, there's different size screws, so I have a, an iFixit kit that I, I got for my birthday for my wife, and uh, it, it's great. So. Moving on to disassembling this, it's pretty simple, and if you've already got a water block installed, it's actually very, very simple to start taking these things apart. The back plate um, just has a couple screws in it, and those screws, once you take them out, will take the, the water block off too. So it's super simple. I'm going to try to reuse the thermal pads that are on here. Something that may actually help you too, if you have a water block, you may notice that it's thinner than the two PCI slots, so getting a box or something to lay it on while you have it upside down is a good idea. It doesn't have to be exact, and if you have a mod mat or something from uh, Gamers Nexus, it has a layout like similar to this. Um, I'm just drawing it out myself, so I remember where to put these screws when I take them off. Now one thing to note too, most are going to have some kind of RGB plug inside. If you have fans, there's always going to be a fan header inside there as well. Uh, we can't really get that off without starting to take the block off, but there is some slack you can see. So the easiest way to go about that is making sure you have all the screws off and take a look inside of there and know what to expect. And if you have a water block, you're always gonna have that, that RGB header if there's RGB in it. Um, you see this this actually has two headers because this is the same PCB that's used on the, the same GPU for a fan header. Um, so let's move on. Just like removing a car tire, 
Um, you do kind of want the pressure to be equally removed across these screws so that way you don't damage the GPU. Um, it's more of an issue when you're putting it back together because when you are putting it back together the the, the die is not squished in there and stuck with paste and thermal pads and all that. Once you've got the screws removed from the back, if you take a look in here, there are a few extra screws that are that you have to get to from the other side of the back plate. So the only way to get into this one is to now uh, take the block off. So we'll do that next. When you're moving a block, you just want to take it slow um, because it may get stuck pretty, pretty solid. And there's that one header, so we'll just lay this down. With these headers, you always just want to remove them, not by pulling the wires, but by pulling the plastic part. Um, so that gets that off. So that's the block removed. Um, and actually for this, we may not need to remove the back plate, but you can see those extra screws here um, for the back plate. And there's just a few. Those um, are fine. The back plate is actually nice because it, it uh, dissipates some of the heat from the back of the memory modules. There's some thermal pads in there. It makes a small difference, but it's not huge. Um, I'm glad that these thermal pads didn't get uh, damaged at all. That one has a bubble in it just from me pulling it up, but not a big deal. We're going to go ahead and remove the thermal paste on this, and then we'll get the multimeter out next. Okay, so now you've got the block off and you want to figure out what resistors connect to the 12 volt power plane. So you pull out your phone and you look up PCI Express pinout and you look at a picture like this because you know that's an 8 pin PCI Express. And then you're looking at it and you say, wow, that picture doesn't look like that. But here's the thing. This picture is made for the, the plug that's going in. So if you compare your picture to the plug, yes, it does. It actually looks that way. And then this goes into that. So the receiving end of this is a mirror image of what you'll see on the pinout. So what that means is the part that's opposite of the clip, the clips go this way, are the 12 volt lines. So these first three, one, two, and three on the outside. So now I'll let you know that which ones of these are the 12 volt, you can get your multimeter and start looking at where there's continuity. So the easiest way to do this I like resistance mode so I can see what the actual resistance is, but you can use resistance or continuity mode where it makes a beep. And I'll show you the difference here. Um, so if I know that the 12 volts are connected, I can touch the two 12 volt lines and it says, hey, there's a, there's like a really small resistance there because they're connected. It's saying 0.3 ohms. So I can also use that same continuity test to see what these resistors are. Cause those look, those look like the ones I'm looking for, but they're, there's three of them, and I know there's only two plugs, so where are those going? So I can look at this left one and compare it on both sides. Okay, so there's some, some number there. It's not infinite. What if I compare it to this one that's next to it? Is that a really big number, right? So that's probably not the one that's connected to that one. Let me try this one. Okay, so these two are connected both to this. Well, what about this third one way down here? Uh, let's, let's see. Big number. Let's try this other one. That's a big number too. So there's some circuitry in between here and there. What's this one actually going to? Well, if you look at the pinout for the PCI Express, these first three pins in the PCI Express slot is where power goes. So if you look at the resistance there, you get a small number. So this last one is PCI Express Power. These two are the ones we're looking for uh, doing our little mod to. So I've got some resistors already out of the case and I just lost one. Well, here's one of them. Okay, found the other one, I dropped it on the floor. So there it is. So these are these two resistors and you may notice they look really similar except this one says, R008 and those say R005. So the resistance value is a little different and uh, we'll just solder this up. 
staple it on top, check the resistance, make sure we got a good connection, and then go from there. Okay, so I'm doing a voiceover for this part because I uh, forgot to plug in the microphone. So just moving on, I had some G-Lit Extreme that's a couple years old and it ended up drying out. Uh, so I had to clean this off and I'm just using some old MSI paste out of an air cooler that I had. As far as thermal paste application goes, you know, the X is fine. Uh, we Everybody used to say to use the big P in the middle. Some people say you got to spread it. You know, as long as there's paste over the whole GPU die and there aren't any gaps in it and it's as thin as possible, it's going to be good application. So just put enough to make sure you cover it. You know, more is better, less is not enough. So if you ever have a question, put a little bit more than you think you need to and wipe it off. You know, one thing too, if you're doing any extreme cooling, uh, you may actually want a little a little bit extra paste that will roll off the sides and connect the sides of the die. Okay, I'm just going to hook up the RGB header back the way it was. And all the thermal pads luckily are uh, pretty well intact. And the ones, some stuck to the uh, water block and then some stuck to the memory. So just kind of make sure they're in place. And then uh, normally when you go to install a block, you can see the holes, you know, on the back side of it. So you can line everything up. Uh, this one you can't because the there's you can't see through the top, right? Because there's all this Oris branding and stuff. So just do your best. Uh, I kind of just peer at it from in in the middle of the sandwich, so to speak, and then you can kind of just line them up and you can slide it around a little if you really need to, uh, but try not to. And here I I kind of touch the die, so you're you're committed at that point, and you can already see that I'm at a little bit of an angle. Um, it's not perfect. I'm going to have to give her a little twist to line it back up. Um, a little bit more movement than I, I normally like, but it happens, you know. So if you really want to, you can you can take it back apart, put new paste on it, and try it again. It's just one of those things you kind of only get one shot, so that's what you got to do. Um, so this is me looking at it and realizing that it was a little bit uh, askew. And now when you flip it back over, you can see where those holes are. So hopefully those holes are pretty close, little fine adjustments, and you'll be good to go. So when you start putting the screws back in, uh, always go for the GPU die screws first. And, you know, sometimes the specific screws may be slightly different length. And those are done by hand usually. So... Try to remember which screws went where and put the same ones back in the same place. And uh, that'll make sure that at least the tension is the same and it's consistent to the spec that it was originally designed and manufactured for. Um, do a little cross pattern, get them started just a little bit, just like when you're installing a CPU cooler. And then uh, you'll be fine. And once you get past those four GPU screws, the rest don't really matter. You can just put them all in. Um, but those four GPU screws are really the most important ones. So make sure those are perfectly square, all the same tension. And you can kind of do that with, you know, I, I use the, the two finger method. So I use two fingers on this little screwdriver and I twist until I feel like it's a little too hard to twist. And you'll, you'll know that feeling where it's like, okay, that's where it stops. And uh, you can use that just to make sure each one is, you know, fingertip tight. You don't want them to be super tight. You don't want to crush the die. All you're trying to do is squeeze the paste out from between the die and the block to get as little paste in there as possible. Because that paste is really not a good thermal conduct 
uh, thermal conductor, sorry. And uh, with the rest of these screws, just uh, put them in. I don't think I do these in any order, just kind of screwing them in. And that's the block put back on. Okay, now we're set back up. Got everything set up here on my test bench with the um, RTX 2080 Ti with the uh, power mod on there. And I did a fire strike benchmark and you know, go figure, I got the same exact score. So I tried to push the core clocks a little higher. Um, it, this, this car tops out at about 2130. Um, and even then it's got to be below 30 degrees or else the voltage drops and it won't be stable. And that brings me to the, to the whole point behind all of this. The, the real limitation on these is voltage. And you know, I was thinking about it, Nvidia really probably didn't want to leave any performance on the table. So doing a power mod may not be the fix all that it seems like it might be uh, because the limitations on this card was between voltage and power when I did the original test and you can see that in GPU Z, whatever the limitation is. And now it shows, you know, never goes above 60, 70% power because the GPU thinks that it's pulling less power than it actually is. Uh, but now it's hitting the voltage limitation. So it's still limited. Um, I was able to get a little bit more power out of it and actually, uh, it actually made it a little more unstable because of that power limitation. If you just crank the slider all the way, uh, now it, and now it thinks it's, able to pull more power than it can um, but the voltage doesn't match what it thinks it should be pulling so uh, it only works is if you can get the voltage right and you can only do that with you know cooling down to a level that lets you get the max voltage so these usually run around 1.05 volts if you get below 30 degrees you can get 1.081 volts and that gets me stable at 2160 and that's about the best this gpu will do until we go uh, subambient cooling uh, liquid nitrogen or dry ice or something like that. So do I recommend this? Absolutely not. It's not worth it. Uh, the GT or sorry, RTX 20 ATI from Gigabyte, this one has a power uh, allowance of 366 watts already. And that might, I think that's one of the highest that Nvidia allows in the BIOS. And the limitation really is from PCI power. So you can only get 150 watts per spec through each of these, that's 300 watts, and then maybe 75 watts through the PCIe slot. So you'll never see a card that has two eight pins with a power budget higher than 375 watts. It ends up being 366 with losses. And that's really the maximum that they can put by spec. So the way they're designed, they're pushing as much power as they possibly can because they don't wanna leave performance on the table because that would only make them look worse when they get compared to other GPU manufacturers or the other one GPU manufacturer. So, you know, it's not, not the cure-all, but it is a way to get a little bit more power. So if you are going sub-ambient cooling where you can get those higher voltages because you can't access them until you get the GPU below certain thresholds, and that's typically what your limitation is, uh, most of these will do 2100 pretty easily. Uh, this one seems to be pretty decent. Um, in the memory, I got it up to about 1350. And that's running in my super high-tech uh, ice bucket here. So I got the GPU, it's running at about 20 degrees with some ice packs in the water. And that keeps it nice and cool just for this testing purposes to see what I can get out of it uh, maximum. So I don't recommend this. It voids the warranty. Uh, it's a lot of risk. And it's really just not worth it if you don't plan on doing anything extreme. With that said, now that I've done this, this is gonna be my project uh, card, so to speak, and I'm gonna take it apart some more, try to do some volt mods, uh, maybe build in a potentiometer that I can actually adjust voltage manually. And I'm pretty sure it scales all the way up to 1.2 volts. So that's what I'll be working on next, and then working on some dry ice and liquid nitrogen. If you like this kind of content, please uh, comment down below, subscribe, do all those types of things, and I'll continue to post more stuff. Hopefully keep posting stuff weekly and it'll, it'll get better, a little, a little better in quality as I get more used to this video editing business. So I'll see you next time.